and this presentation is about creating nati native iOS and Android apps in Scala. And uh, before we actually start with the presentation, uh, it's probably worth showing a very quick demo. So these are two applications that um, effectively run uh, on Android and iOS. And the interesting part about it, despite the fact that they are not really capable of doing much, uh, is uh, that they are both written in Scala. And not only that, but uh, they're effectively CRUD applications. And there is a backend uh, service also written in Scala that's running um, in the background. So you now you can do simple things like delete an entry, refresh here, and obviously that's gonna reflect into the other app. And you can also access things like photos and add new entries. And all of that will be shared across the back end. Um, and again, the, 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 the interesting part about all of that is that um, it's all Scala code. And even the DTOs that are exchanged, um, even DTOs that are exchanged through, um, th through the, <clears throat> through the back end are effectively um, Scala objects and they are shared between the server and the client. So, uh, this, uh, this talk was actually called Native iOS and Android Apps in Scala Without Tears, but I had to amend the title uh, because it turned out uh, when we were actually writing all of that, it, um, it turned out that it really wasn't uh, without much tears. So uh, as a matter of fact, um, let's actually look at how all of that is possible and, 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 and what's the road we, talk, uh, we, we took in order to um, get to that point. I think I just need to kind of set up my presenter screen here. Well, anyway, um, so really uh, imagine that you're put in a situation where you are a team of developers and you want to have yourself a mobile application, right? And <clears throat> there are a few ways that, um, a, a few different ways that you can, that you can go about that. Uh, one of them is to go the native way and respectively write um, your version for iOS and Android. And on Android, you benefit from using Java or Kotlin. Um, it's, it's, there's tons of know-how to and support in the community. Um, and you end up with native looking applications that play nicely with the under, underlying platform. Not only that, but you're running on a mature VM that, that you're probably all quite familiar with. You're running the JVM. Um, on iOS, uh, you end up writing your code in Objective-C uh, or Swift, and uh, you benefit from great development workflow. Um, you're writing in Xcode probably, so it's quite mature and well-known ID that that's also I, I actually quite like. And of course, you have the added benefit that your runtime is tailored towards a particular range of devices because you know Apple just has sort of a limited range of, of, of devices, of hardware that it produces, unlike with Android. And of course, because uh, you are um, because you're running on Apple, and Apple takes security very, very seriously, so you benefit on, uh, uh, of that as well. And this is especially important if you are in a sort of a more corporate domain. 
So what are some of the drawbacks, though, of this particular approach? Well, first of all, introducing a new language or two can be quite challenging, especially in, in, in teams that are, that if you don't have the capacity to hire more people and you need people to learn new languages, that, that can be a bit uh, hard. Also, going back to an old language, so if you're, well, old, if you're a Scala shop and that it could be quite demoralizing for some people to actually write Java code in case they want to do Android. And, you know, but the biggest problem is probably the fact that you pretty much end up having disjoint code bases. So you end up implementing the same feature twice, most likely, um, for Android on iOS, for example. And all of that gets um, even more painful if your client logic, so if your app logic is quite complicated. So in our particular case, uh, our, our application was offline capable, so it had quite a bit of um, had quite a bit of logic around ev eventually syncing with the back end, so a lot of conflict resolution uh, logic written that was not very trivial, and maintaining that code base in two different languages uh, can quickly become quite the bottleneck. So what is, what is another thing that you can, that you can do? You can um, sort of turn, turn yourself towards using technologies such as Grau, and you probably are all familiar with that, but just to summarize, Grau is a high-performance JIT compiler that uh, is written in Java, and it hooks through the JVM, JVM CI interface. And on top of that, you have Substrate VM that, is, um, that allows you uh, compilation of Java programs into self-contained executables. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the native image support for that can uh, pretty much work with JVM languages like Java, Scala, and Clojure. And because the ARM64 support is, um, is currently being worked on, you pretty much can write code in Java and run it on iOS. And this is, this is actually quite nice. So it's an incredibly powerful technology. However, when we were, at the time when we were considering that, we, there were some drawbacks that, that we, um, that, that we saw. And namely, one of them was the fact that um, at that point, the ecosystem around iOS, iOS support was pretty much non-existent. So you don't only need to compile some code and run it on, on a phone that prints hello's world, uh, but you kind of need to have a mature UI framework that you can use in order to design your applications and, and, um, and kind of structure them in a, in a, in a good way. Um, so at that point in time, that was, that was not really present. And there were some other restrictions that I'm not going to go into much detail um, into, but, uh, you know, re reflection, uh, well, dynamic class loading is not really always possible uh, if you don't know in advance all the, all the, all the things that are going to be loaded. So there are some limitations there that in practice are not that big. But the main point was that work was still undergoing in that space and there was not really a mature ecosystem. But this is changing, so I advise you to actually go and check out the Grau VM talk that's later in this conference, and I think they've made amazing progress and this is a space that deserves uh, being watched. So another, another opportunity that you can obviously um, kind of look at is uh, hybrid solutions, right? So hybrid mobile applications are effectively mobile apps. They're web apps in disguise, right? So what you end up using is the usual run-of-the-mill web stack like JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. And they uh, run in a web view, running pretty much the same code on every platform. And on some platform like iOS, they can benefit from um, some platform-specific optimizations like the neutral JavaScript JIT compiler. Uh, but nevertheless, these are effectively web applications that are running on the phone, right? And as a matter of fact, um, uh, one thing that you can probably uh, see quite often in that space is the combination of Cordova plus Ionic. And um, some of the parts that make up such an application are the Cordova web view, which is where the application actually renders. So this is sort of like a web browser in disguise. And then you have the web app, which pretty much contains all of your JavaScript logic, the, the assets, HTML and CSS. And then you have Cordova plugins that are effectively plugins that hook into the native functionality of the underlying platform. So you can access stuff like camera, sensors, and whatnot. And then you most likely um, end up implementing your app using the Ionic framework, which is a set of front-end components that try to mimic the way of um, the, the way native um, UI components look like. 
And um, you know, from a schematic point of view, uh, like if you look up of that combination, you'll probably see a picture that looks like this. Uh, you have the web app and the plugins of the site that you can that you can um, tap into in order to access uh, functionality, and 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 the web app is rendered in the HTML rendering view. However, um, some of the cons that, that, that this brings is the fact that you might very well have some performance problems on other phones. And um, you also um, are limited to um, the native functionality that's provided by plugins. And from my research uh, a little while ago, I, I, not all of the plugins are quite up to date. So you're kind of relying on a lot of third party stuff that, that's in the ecosystem. And uh, of course, as you might imagine, this is not really suited for high-end graphics. After all, this particular, uh, this particular technology is for, is for web applications. And um, it's also, there is this thing that's not necessarily a, um, that's not necessarily a drawback. Uh, it's a bit hard to get the app to feel quite native uh, from what I've seen. But this, of course, is not always bad because uh, there are great apps that, that are actually, um, such as Spotify, for example, or Quora. They, they are great apps, they don't look native at all, um, but nevertheless, they work and they're, they're very nice to use. So another thing that you might consider is uh, using React Native, right? And React Native is a pretty great framework that allows developers uh, to build native applications using JavaScript. And while Cordova actually uh, runs inside a web view, React Native um, is using native UI components under the hood for the respective platform. So for example, a next native text input for iOS and Android will have a corresponding React Native um, component uh, that, it will, uh, that, that you interact with in JavaScript and, and it, you delegate and it delegates to the native components. So, in essence, there is no compilation of JavaScript into native code base, uh, into native code uh, on the device, and there is no web view HTML or CSS. So um, pretty much the big picture is that you end up with sort of a two words, worlds that are connected. You have your native code and modules that are written in Objective-C or Swift or Java, and then on the, other hand, you, on the other hand, you have a very lightweight JavaScript VM um, which uh, runs the JavaScript code that you have written. And these two worlds communicate over the React Native Bridge, which is a component that's responsible for, between the, for the communication between these two threads. Um, so what happens when you actually run an app, uh, a React Native app? Well, a bundler pretty much packages your JS code into a single JS file and um, applies some transformations on it. Then the entry point is loaded on your device and that spawns the JavaScript uh, VM thread. And then the JavaScript, uh, the JavaScript VM thread and the native thread communicate over the bridge. So if you have to draw it, it kind of looks a bit like this. You have these two worlds that are, that are connected via the bridge that's passing messages and via proprietary protocol. Um, so how does an actual React Native app look like from um, sort of an anatomy perspective? Well, it's, first of all, it's important to understand some of the concepts around React Native. Um, React Native apps are built of components, and that's uh, what's the building block of applications. And these components encompass props, state, and the render logic. And then you have the render logic, which is pretty much a function of state and props. And it, uh, as a matter of fact, um, defines how your, how your, um, what's going to be rendered on screen. Props are uh, much like constructor arguments that they allow you to parameterize, um, to parameterize your components. Uh, but they're a bit smarter because React Native uses them in order to do some um, smart diffing around the render logic. And then you have state, which is the internal state of the component at any point that could be mutated, unlike props. Um, so it could be mutated by input from the user and whatnot, and whenever that state is mutated, most of the time the result of that is the reevaluation of the render function. And then you also have style, which is a special prop that most of the core components take and kind of defines how your components look like. So how does a very simple component look like? This is, this is sort of a, uh, this is a, um, a, a JavaScript code. Um, there's gonna be Scala later, I promise. Um, that, that defines a very simple component that uh, pretty much defines two children components, a text input 
where you can type some text and then a text box that's gonna reflect what you've typed, right? And um, there is a, there is a um, callback function on the text input that pretty much does a state update. So updates the state of the component with what you've just entered. And when that happens, your render function is reevaluated. So you're showing now the new, the, new, the new stuff on the screen that you've entered. So if you want to think about it from a data flow perspective, it, it kind of looks like this. You have the root component and then the state is passed as props. So your initial state is, is initiated based on these props. And then props are passed down to the input. When the input modifies the state, it calls uh, set state via the callback. And then this triggers reevaluation of the root component render function and effectively stuff changes on screen. So if you think about it, so far we have a pretty mature technology that's giving you quite a bit of power for creating native apps because you're using native, native components underneath. There is sensible performance because these native components have been engineered particularly for this platform. And um, you also have easy access to the platform native functionalities of the device. So, um, uh, and on top of that, you're developing in JavaScript. So by that time, we already know that we can use a single language that, um, that you know, is JavaScript. But do we actually want that? That's, that's the question. So um, going further, we might ask ourselves whether we can do better. And um, in order to answer that question, it, Scala.js deserves a look, right? So it's a compiler that turns your Scala code into the equivalent JavaScript one. And the great thing about it is that you obtain the long-term benefits of writing code in a statically typed language. And um, you, you, you can use the Scala ecosystem, the ID in, in, in the compiler, and, and, and this is all pretty great, especially for people who are Scala developers. Um, but the, probably the biggest selling point is the fact that you can share code between the server and the client, right? And through cross compilation. So this is, this is probably the biggest selling point. Some things that you probably have to consider though when you're doing that is that, um, you know, where you're writing Scala code and that has, that is going to be compiled with Scala.js, you probably need to remember that th th there shouldn't really be any blocking. Everything is async and, um, there is no real concurrency as the JS engine is pretty much single threaded as far as I know. And another interesting aspect is that runtime type tests are, uh, are, are, are based on values. So, so you know, you have uh, everything that's, for example, larger than 128 uh, can match shorten, float, or double. So, um, and you also uh, need to be aware that to avoid the additional overhead um, of error handling, uh, the error handling is simplified. So there is no array index out of bounds exceptions and, 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 and that kind of stuff. And of course, reflection is prohibited as it makes that code elimination quite hard. And that's, that's something that's, um, that you see why it's important later. So what is the compilation pipeline and, 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 and sort of a bird's eye perspective. So the, you have the initial compilation that turns your Scala files to dot class and the Scala.js intermediate representation. And then you can go both uh, two ways. So you can do a fast optimization, which pretty much does dead code elimination and lining and uh, reduces your, uh, the size of your output quite significantly. But you can also do full optimization, which as far as I know, runs um, the Google Closure compiler on top of it in advanced optimization mode. And, and um, this produces even smaller executables. And uh, this is some of the statistics that, that I got. Um, uh, pretty much, if you, if you think about it, for, for an example program that's a full output of, of around 20 megabytes, after the, the, the fast stop, you're down to around 600 kilobytes. Uh, and then if you run the Google Closure compiler on top of it, um, you're, effectively, um, uh, you're effectively down to around 200 uh, kilobytes. So if we kind of need to step back, what, what, what do we have so far? So um, we, can, we know that we can write JavaScript that interfaces directly with native UI components, right? And we know also that Scala.js allows you to write facades for JS libraries and use them directly from your Scala code. And all of that provides us with the needed parts to actually write some Scala code that calls native components on, 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 the, on, on the underlying device. So that's, uh, that's kind of 
uh, the rationale that led us to creating this framework called SCAR that we are using uh, for our application development. And SCAR is effectively this. It allows you to write Scala code that drives your mobile applications and is, is compiled to JavaScript and deployed to, to your mobile device. And it uses React Native um, to, to render things. So um, it provides a very thin wrapper around React Native primitives and allows, to, allows you to write type Scala code. Of course, works both on Android and iOS. And it provides quite adequate performance as it delegates to native UI components. And you can also, of course, leverage the already existing React Native frameworks. So if you have to kind of think about what you can do with that is, um, so when you write some Scala codes, you can take a, 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 a few ways. You can use in Scala the React Native core components such as text, flat lists, and whatnot that we've provided facades for. Um, you can also pull in external React Native component that you write facades for. You can also pull in any JavaScript library that you write a facade for. Uh, but what's probably even uh, more great is that uh, you can cross-compile uh, libraries uh, with Scala.js. So for example, you pick a, on uh, Mutes by Lee Howey, it's um, they're their libraries that 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 you can that you can use both on your on your uh, mobile client and on your server because they are cross compiled. And after all, after you decide to use all of these things or some of them, this all of your code goes through the Scala JS compiler and then the React Native bundler picks it up, bundles it, and runs it on your on your device. So. What does the anatomy of a simple app look like? Um, so again, looking at our JavaScript code we, we, that we already saw, it looks a bit like this, right? Um, so if we have to translate that to Scala and using SCAR, it would sort of look like this, right? It's, um, it's, uh, uh, it's the Scala equivalent. So if we compare these two versions, you can quickly see that they are structurally the same. So if you're familiar with React Native concepts, you can quickly jump in and, 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 and understand what's going on here. Um, despite, well, there is a bit of a difference. You know, on the Scala side, we have, we, we, we have typed uh, objects. So our props and state are in fact types that are case classes. And um, it's not just any kind of object. And uh, your callback as well is typed, so you get a string, and now you can benefit from all the stuff around um, in your in your in your standard Scala library. So um, we also provide a uh, base screen class component that that provides you with some some interesting things. So um, it contains facilities to enable navigation, like going between screens back and forth. And it also contains logic to properly serialize and deserialize uh, React Native props for passing across the JS and the native bridge. And it, of course, also enforces the implementation of the needed functions like render and whatnot. It also provides you uh, hooks, so methods that you can override to hook yourself into the life cycle of the components. And it also gives you a typed ability to define um, your initial state based on props. So, um, Apart from, apart from all of that, um, a lot of the applications that are, that are actually uh, running out there on your mobile devices use some kind of persistence. So um, we, we also wanted to use persistence and we wanted to have a database that's, that's, in, that's running on, on the phone, on the device, and we wanted to actually uh, use instead of just issuing SQL commands, we wanted to actually use some kind of a more high-level um, query representation for, for, for that functionality. So we decided to look at Quill. And Quill, as probably a lot of you know, or all of you, um, uses quoted queries. So it passes uh, each quoted block at compile time and translates this into an internal AST. Um, and this allows for compile time query generation, which is uh, pretty great because at compile time, when you have your uh, quotation AST, you can uh, Quill can generate into the target language uh, for the specific for the particular platform, and this allows you uh, to this this provides for quite minimum overhead um, at runtime because 
at the end of the day, at runtime, you're just ending up with using the, the, the raw SQL string or whatever target language representation this is. And, um, and this pretty much, from an overhead perspective, just kind of boils down to almost using a, 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 a driver directly and supplying SQL to it. So it, the added benefit of all of that is that you can also do compile time validation against your, uh, against your um, database schema in Quill. So this is, this is pretty great. And of course, it can be extensible because you can hook it with any kind of database driver if you write the this, this context for it. So um, we pretty much after, so, so we pulled in Quill as a dependency, cross-compiled with Scala.js, and we ended up being able to do the following, right? So, this code that can actually run on the device. Um, you have a lookup method that pretty much gives you one device back. So it looks up from at, at the device's table and gets the first record if there is any. So what happens when you run that? Well, first of all, when you compile that, uh, the SQL is generated, right? At that point, um, this is passed to a custom SQLite context that you wrote. Uh, and Oh, that, that's working with Quill. And on top of that, we also wrote the facade, the Scala.js facade for SQLite. So there is a React Native SQLite storage plugin that you can use, and uh, we put that in as a dependency, you wrote a facade for it. Um, so this, is, this, this context delegates directly to this facade, and what, sen what ends up happening at the end of the day is that this is getting run on your device, and it's calling the SQLite database that's there. So, but, you know, we wanted to kind of uh, also add a bit more principality to the whole thing, right? Well, it's, we wanted a bit more tight integration between DB and, and, and the UI, right? And we realized that uh, why do you actually need a database, right? And what do you want to do with it when you're on the device? Well, pretty much what's, what ends up happening, at least in our scenarios quite often, is that we want to be able to mutate the state of our components based on um, some changes in the database that are happening. So what we ended up doing is that we decided to write a component that uh, represents a single dispatch entry point for all database operations on the device. And there is this mechanism that's a dynamic publish subscribe mechanism for database updates um, that are happening on the device. So you end up being able to subscribe to database changes and your screen state dynamically updates on whenever the, anything about the database is changed. And uh, this is pretty great because it propagates across screens as well. So if you have to kind of, if we have to illustrate that with a simple example, uh, what, we, what we have is, imagine we have these three case classes, right? So you have um, the user state, which is a screen state, so that's a component state, and it contains the first, the last name, and the time time when it was loaded, right? And then you have the props that are passed to the screen, this is just the user ID. And um, you also have a user, that's a case class, that's the D D DB record, right, that you're gonna get back from Quill. So um, that's, a, that's a, again, a pretty silly example, uh, but that's as much as I could fit on screen, really. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's some code written with SCAR. It's, it's a screen that um, extends DB-enabled screen, so provides all of that database functionality. So what happens here is that um, you, um, you end up, uh, when, when, you, when you load your screen, uh, pretty much you, you, you pass it props that are the ID of some, of some user. And what's happening is that you're querying the, you're loading a particular user from, from, the, from the database, and you're displaying its first and last name on screen, and you have a button. That, and when you press that button, what's gonna happen is that you're gonna shuffle or reverse the first name of the user, and then you're gonna update that entry into the database. And then um, your, your, your screen will re-render and show the updated version. So it's like you're not directly mutating the state of the screen, you're going through the database. And that, of course, goes through to all the rest of the screens. So really, from, from, from a data flow perspective, again, the way to imagine it is that, um, let's say we have one DB-enabled screen, right? And we have this component called the DB event dispatcher that we, that we, um, that we provided. Um, whenever the screen appears, 
what's happening is that um, it re registers itself with um, with the dispatcher on mounting, right? And um, initially, it reads the state from the database and displays it. So when you press the button to reverse the name, what's happening is that you're issuing a database write command that, uh, th that dispatches this write to this, this event, this DB event dispatcher. And these, th that write entry point is a single entry point. Um, and these uh, DB writes are sort of implicitly serialized stuff. And um, when um, this dispatcher writes, uh, uh, writes uh, to the database and the operation completes, all of the subscriber sc uh, subscribed screens are notified that there is a state change in the database. And really the notification is not more than just going through, through the list and calling the onDB update method on, on, on the particular screen. Uh, and of course, you can hook into that screen, and m most of the time what you would want to do is most likely um, pretty much uh, reload the state from the database that you're interested in, uh, because you know that there is some state change. And um, you know, the beauty, the beauty of most of that is uh, that, as a matter of fact, this is all uh, quite easy to implement, because you don't really, you don't really, care too much about concurrency of like threat safety because you know that this will this particular part will actually run in the on the JavaScript VM on the device. So uh, you, know, you don't need some fancy concurrent data structures to store that stuff and you don't care about visibility and, and all of that because you know you're safe with that. So we also added uh, some um, stuff around navigation, right? So um, there is uh, there is a uh, project called React Native Navigation, uh, Wix React Native Navigation, that uh, provides 100% native uh, platform navigation for both Android and iOS. So it's pretty great. It, it, uses, uh, it uses the native navigation functionalities of, of the underlying platform. It supports various um, layouts, uh, such as stacked, tapped layout, and, and um, it, it looks quite nice. And it also uh, provides you additional, some, some additional life hooks into the, into the screen life cycle components, such as component did update, et cetera. So uh, we really kind of defined these, these sort of, the, these are some of the methods that are, that are um, on this uh, J JavaScript facade. Um, and, but if you want to read more, you probably uh, just, you're better off just going to, to and, and, and checking out the React Native Navigation. But we have that as a dependency and in, 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 in it's a facade that we provide for it. Uh, however, uh, it's uh, it's not so directly exposed. We are using that, but uh, we we figured out that we don't really need a lot more than just going between screens and returning back from screen and and returning. Uh, we also provide some functionality for a screen having a return value. So if you go to a screen, for example, and you 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 input your password or something, we want the screen that was that initiated that action to actually obtain the result once it's done. So things like that that provide for a bit more ergonomics around um, around development. So with all that said, uh, there are some uh, you know there are some there are some tears that that kind of uh, were were present in the whole process, and um, and that was mainly due to the fact that um, me and I was working with Andre Varga and. Matthias Donitz and, and, and Bullet, and um, none of us were really experts in, in mobile UI development or, or, or JavaScript or React Native or Scala.js for that matter. So uh, all of that stuff was quite new to us and we encountered some pretty interesting uh, challenges, I must say. So first of all, we had uh, quite a challenge around bundling, right? So uh, as I already mentioned, uh, Metro is um, the bundler used by React Native to bundle all of your JS code to be loaded on the device. And it kind of does a few, a few things that are, uh, that are more notable. So we have resolution that pretty much builds a graph of all the modules that you depend on in your JavaScript code. Then you have the transformation, which kind of optimizes your JavaScript code, uh, JavaScript code. So it does, it does um, some kind of static analysis and, and, and and optimizes your JavaScript code further. And then you have serialization, which pretty much is the point at which all, all, all of uh, your transport modules are combined into a single 
JS file uh, and upload it to the device. Now, the problem that we kept facing was that uh, when we were compiling with, with Scala.js and we had these uh, pretty big JavaScript files, uh, Metro was choking on, on, on them, right? So um, as I said, our app is quite non-trivial in terms of logic. So it's like a lot of Scala code, right? Um, and you end up with a pretty sizable uh, JavaScript file. So uh, what ended up happening is that we started seeing these uh, we started seeing these timeout errors that 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 ha uh, that were happening, and um, and uh, we just couldn't really get uh, around that very easily. Even increasing the timeout is, is just not sensible. I mean, waiting for five minutes to just transform your code it's it's, it's a horrible development experience, right? So we started thinking, well, why is that happening, and it's like, what is going on? Uh, so. Actually, what's happening is, is quite interesting, right? The transformation phase uh, with uh, of Metro uh, pretty much builds a full AST of your code, right? And uh, as this has been engineered for sizes of uh, uh, smaller sizes uh, in terms of your JavaScript code, so smaller files, uh, once you go over like 10 megabytes of, 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 of code, uh, Metro starts to choke quite quite quickly, and we read that, um, as a matter of fact, it's probably not such a bad idea to circumvent that transformation phase altogether because, after all, for our production deployment, we are running the Google Closure compiler on top of it, and, uh, and uh, as far as we've read, it's, it's just pretty aggressive optimization. So most likely, we are not getting too much out of the Metro transformer itself. So why don't we just forget about it and, 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 and just um, surpass it, and this is exactly what we did. Um, so we actually in in, in the in the metro uh, in, in the metro bundling uh, pipeline, we uh, had to write our custom transformer, which is really not all that complicated. But what it does is pretty much it um, it um, it looks for it 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 looks for the files that that are output with 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 uh, from Scala.js and that have been optimized. And it just skips skips the transformation phase with them, and effectively for all the other files, it it delegates to the default transformer. So um, one of the problems with that was the fact that uh, we had some problems with the source maps. So it's like the bugging became quite 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 hard, and this is something that we are still working on to to sort of figure out how to do that uh, correctly. Apart from that. Um, we, we experienced, so there was another project that was sort of trying to do the same thing, and, and, and they did, uh, it was called SRI, and uh, the thing that we noticed with, with, with this particular um, project is that they were relying quite heavily on um, traits that were extending uh, uh, JS object, so native JavaScript classes, and uh, they had to do that because um, this is what, for example, your props need to be. They need to be JavaScript objects, and uh, we kind of really wanted to have case classes for that, right? So be completely in Scala land, and that was that was a bit of a problem. So um, uh, what, what we did is that uh, we we defined this uh, JS object abstraction that uh, combined with some macro magic allows you to pretty much Take your case classes and, 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 and bundle them into the respective JavaScript JavaScript object format, um, and uh, it was uh, it's it's quite interesting that that actually solved our problem. So Matthias was working on that, and and, and it it and, and he's pretty good with with macros and types in general. So it's um, it's kind of provided for a really a lot more ergonomic experience. Um, and apart from that, what the additional added benefit of that. Uh, um, the additional added benefit of all that was that uh, we were able to kind of m m mold our uh, mold our JS objects and JS facades a little bit better. So, for example, if you look at the uh, native React Native view component uh, and its documentation, you quickly see that uh, it actually contains a huge uh, list of arguments that this constructor takes. And some of them are specific to iOS, some of them are specific to Android. And, uh, 
And this is n n not really great from our organization perspective of, of your code. So we came up with this JS object flat on abstraction that pretty much allows you to group these things together into case classes. And, um, and at the end of the day, when, when, when that gets to the JavaScript code, all of that will be exploded and, 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 it, and it will be flattened into one long list of arguments. So this allows for better um, organization of your code. So you can have Android, um, just Android specific props separated into a separate case class and, and, and iOS specific props that, that, you are, that you're working with. So in summary, um, SCAR is a pretty lightweight framework that enables you to use Scala for your mobile applications. And um, it provides ergonomic abstractions uh, for handling navigation and persistence. And that was something that uh, ergonomic to us, right? They might not be that ergonomic to the community, but this was something that we needed and we, 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 saw, um, we saw some of the pain points and, and we, we provided solutions for that. And of course, there were some tears involved in the development process. It, it wasn't all smooth as, uh, as I said, none of us were really, that was the first time for, for all of us. Um, work is still undergoing and we plan to open source that. Uh, we just want to make it a bit more um, ergonomic. So, and then we, we, we want to abstract the user of the library as much as possible from all the intricacies around uh, deploying React Native apps and initializing React Native projects and whatnot. Um, so, uh, this, is, this, is, this is kind of it. Uh, thank you for all the attention, and uh, I hope you liked that presentation, and I hope you use CAR once it's out. Thank you. So we have three minutes left for some questions. So for the one who wants, I ask you to be very brief. <laughs> who would like to ask a question? Yeah, so very, very quick question. Uh, you mentioned that you wish us to use CAR once it's out. So when is the, the release? The, the official release date. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have a we don't have a date that's that's set in stone. Um, I, I'd say that the work is done. So so this 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 thing is running. We're and it's not just kind of an experiment that it's like oh yeah look at this we did that. Uh, it's we are our production app depends on that. So so this is working. It's ready. Um, it's just a matter of really pulling it out and, and open sourcing it, and, and that was my task personally. And I should have been ready by now, but unfortunately, uh, you know, you're always like 99% ready. In this case, not even started. Uh, so I, I hope, uh, like after the conference, I'll have uh, a bit more time. So I hope I'll take the time and, and actually open source that. It's all about just admin stuff really, just putting it on GitHub, setting up builds, writing some tests, writing proper documentation so it's easy for everyone to, to kind of approach that. Um, but I think it's a very interesting thing because uh, it's, the big part about it is that we really managed to share Scala code that is really, really non-trivial. I mean, we have some very complicated Scala logic around conflict resolution and conflict aware types. We have shapeless and this and that. And all of that is shared in our common module and runs both on the back end and on Android and iOS. So it's, it's great thanks to Scala.js mostly. Hi, uh, so uh, I've uh, quick two questions. Uh, one is that uh, once it's released, there, uh, will there be enough materials and tutorials and uh, probably some videos to uh, help us use that? Oh, and another question is it, is it dependent on uh, React Native, right? So once uh, you know, Google releases new Android or you know, Apple releases new iOS, and if there are some changes, then uh, you you need to wait until the Re uh, React Native respond to that, and then also your company need to respond to that, right? So, uh, do you think that your company will be quick enough to, you know, make changes to work with the new version? So, well, hopefully, yeah. I mean, it's well. First of all, to the first question, it's it's that's why it's not released yet, right? Because we need to have documentation and, and, and tutorials and whatnot. Uh, so that's why it's not released. And um, secondly, um, yes, I hope that we will have the capacity to quickly enough, uh, 
you know, quickly enough uh, follow up with, with all release of React Native and whatnot. Although you, it's not as easy, there are always some problems involved, to be honest, like this ecosystem is very, yeah, there's always some problems involved, but I hope we'll be able to to provide adequate support. And after all, this is why it's released to the community, so the community itself can also pick it up and, and, and work with it and hopefully provide some support. Yeah, I guess that the uh, key would be that, you know, open source, right? So if you, once you guys open source it, then many many more people can help, right? I guess. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And we don't really know whether people are actually excited about that or whether they're actually gonna pick it up and use it because it's, yeah, we don't really know. But it was useful to us, definitely. Okay. Thank you. So if there is not more question, so I thank you for your attention. I thank also <laughs> the wonderful speakers that we had. And we meet in 15 minutes in this room to have the ACAS stream to the extreme by Eiko Sieberger. So see you later.